Welcome, everybody. Um, we're really excited that you've joined us today. Um, the, on behalf of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative, I would like to thank Paul and Carol Hill, who provide the support for this Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Unfortunately, Mr. and Mrs. Hill could not attend tonight, but I think Ta uh, Taylor Blaisdell, their granddaughter, um, will be joining us. So if we can just give a round of applause to them. So I've always been an ambitious woman and the thirst for connecting with others like me increased when I entered B-School, unsurprisingly. I came from the international development world where women often are the majority of the staff and the stark contrast at business school where we barely represent 30% of the class provided me with a really tangible image of our struggle in the business world. And it drove me to look for badass women to meet and to bring to campus and to work with. I had to dig because most of the class discussions, the cases, and the speakers didn't feature women, other than through the annual Graduate Women in Business Conference, and it was there that I met the CEO of the Rock Creek Group, Afsana Beschloss, and I ignored the annoying voices in my head that often impede me and maybe others um, from approaching strangers and making valuable connections, and I walked up to her after her keynote address and told her, among other thoughtful commentaries, that I'd love to explore opportunities to work for her. And I landed my summer internship then and there, and I think that's a good example of women supporting women in business. And at the time, I had been studying impact investing, and so I found the PAX Elevate Global Women's Index Fund, a fund that invests in companies that advance women's leadership. And this led me to discover Elevest, I immediately wanted to work for this company, a genius concept and the epitome of mission driven to me. And I also found out about our very own entrepreneur in residence at the time, Jenny Abramson, who had just launched Rethink Impact, and I think this was all while having a baby. Um, these two companies are novel in their unapologetic focus on empowering women. And that's not empowerment in a soft sense. That's full independence. That's running companies, and that's leading the economy. And these discoveries that I made were all made in tandem with the Women's March last year. So I feel like something's changing. I have to say that growing up as a sassy feminist was at times lonely. It wasn't the cool thing. Sometimes I had to turn it off to make friends. And I'm glad that's not really the case anymore and that we have these role models to look to for confidence and motivation. It's as if the second I walked into business school last year, the world realized that women are rising up rising up in finance, rising up at work, rising up through startups. And of course, that's not even close to the full story. There's a lot to talk about here in terms of finance and business models and entrepreneurship. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce these two trailblazers, Sally Krawcheck and Jenny Abramson. Sally is the CEO and co-founder of Elevest, a digital investment platform for women. She's also the chair of the Elevate Network and of the aforementioned Global Women's Index Fund. She was previously CEO of Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, Smith Barney, Sanford Bernstein, and wow, does she have some stories to tell about these experiences on Wall Street. You can read all about them in her best-selling book, Own It, <laughs> The Power of Women at Work. And I'm a serious annotator when I read, so you can believe there are some expletives written in the margins next to some of Sally's unbelievable stories. In her own right, Jenny Abramson is the founder and managing partner of Rethink Impact. Her firm is the largest US-based impact venture capital firm investing in female leaders who are using technology to solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Rethink Impact also happens to be the lead investor in Elvis's most recent $35 million round. We're all on the edge of our seats, so please, ladies, get this party started. So I'm going to jump right in. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, thank you, Maddie. That was very kind and uh, so impressive to hear you and everything you've been doing. Um, what I thought we could do today is ask a number of questions of Sally, who's incredible, if you haven't figured that out from Maddie's intro. Um, and a number of those will be questions that I have or have heard others ask. A number of them we got ahead of time from a number of you who wrote in. Uh, and then I'll open it up at the end. We have two mics, and you can come down and uh, ask questions that I missed, missed out on, OK? So first, Sally, talk about for a moment your transition from being the most senior woman ever on Wall Street to running a tech startup, granted in finance, like 
how did that happen? Well, I got fired. That's good. Yeah, if That's we good. actually want to talk about the transition. <laughs> um, and I didn't just get fired once. I got fired twice. So um, I, I really hate to brag about this so soon because we barely know each other. But I do hold the world record, right? The only woman to be fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal twice. <laughs> um, so I began, and for good reasons, by the way. I returned client funds in the downturn and got fired for it. Um, and thought we should have because we missold products. I got reorged out um, despite a business performing well. Just, you know, such is life. Um, so after you know, after you do that twice, you begin to think maybe someone's giving you a signal. You know, just sort of what? In fact, it was funny because after the second time, as you read in the book, um, I was going for an interview to run another big business, a, a big thing, and I'm um, walking down the street of New York and. All of a sudden, I go down. I mean, down. Right, hit a subway grate on my chin, never got my hands down, um, uh, broke some teeth, broke my jaw, uh, whiplash, of course, blood everywhere, and I still see double from it. I actually damaged an optic nerve. Wow. And again, if you, you know, I don't know about this whole signal from on high, but I just was like, you know what? I think it might be time to stop for a second and actually think about whether this is the right next move. And so I took a step back and tried to really think hard about what was important to me and be deeply, deeply honest with myself about what mattered. Was it the big office? So I ran Merrill Lynch and Smith Barney. I was CFO of Citigroup. Was it the you know, acclaim that came from that? Was it the money? Was it the private jet? Was it the warm cookies that were delivered every day at 3 o'clock? Nice. Answer, yes. <laughs> but that was it. And, and was really honest. Was it having an impact? Was it making a difference? Was it making noise? And I actually found that society has so many expectations of us that I had to, I had to wake up early in the morning and try to think hard before I was fully awake. I would drink at night and try to break down the barriers through, the, through alcohol. And at the end of the day, and actually there's now science that backs, that's when you can have these breakthroughs. And at the end of the day, what I decided was most important to me was making a difference and having an impact and building something that mattered. And as I began to look around and say, what is it that I can do that nobody else can do, having worked on Wall Street as one of very few women there, beginning to recognize that we talk a lot about the gender pay gap, which matters a lot. There's also a gender investing gap. It will cost the women in this room more than a million dollars over the course of your lives. If you don't invest as much as the men do, it can cost you $100 a day over the next 10 years. And that somehow on Wall Street, in the investing industry, we had blamed women for not investing. They're too risk averse. They need more financial education. They're not as good at investing. They're not good at math. None of those are true. What we should have been saying is we built a product for men because we were mostly men, because financial advisors are 86% men, and it was all about winning and outperforming and beating the market and trading, right? Industry symbol, a bull. Right, it's a phallic symbol, OK? <laughs> Not a, yeah. If, if we weren't a mixed company, I'd use different words, but we'll just go with phallic symbol. <laughs> The industry was not built for us. The industry was built for men and for that sense of competition. And women look for different things, reaching their goals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, won't invest through words and jargon they don't understand. And so I came to the conclusion, I want to make an impact. Thank goodness you can do it today as an entrepreneur. Back in the day, you had to have million, you had to work at a huge company to break through. You had to spend tons of money just to get a message out. Well, you've got to have the ad budget for ABC, CBS, or NBC. Today, you can go on Twitter if your message is good enough. Or on LinkedIn, where you have two million plus followers. Two and a half. Two and a half million. <laughs> it's changed just in the last year. <laughs> but you can, if you have something to say, can build up a followership for free, right? You can start a company at a fraction of the cost of 10 and 20 years ago. Um, and so I decided, let me take something that matters. Let's ride this wave of change and do something that only I and the team that we put together can do. So you guys did a survey in November, I think, mm -hmm. on women and finance. Tell me the two most interesting data points that you learned that this group might 
want to tweet or want to learn. And just so everyone knows, at Elevest is the Elevest Twitter handle, yeah. at Sally Krawcheck, yeah. at Abramson Jenny, at Rethink Impact, okay. if you feel like tweeting. But tell, what are the yeah. two, two things that might be interesting? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the most interesting thing is the, um, the question that really stood out for me was, two, we asked 1,000 women, 1,000 men, for the 1,000 women, what is the number one driver of your confidence in your future? Okay? It was not how I'm doing at work. It was not my relationship with my family. It was not what's going on in DC. It was not how much money I make. It was not my schooling. It was, am I investing? Number one, the act of investing. You know what number two and three were? How much I've invested and how much I've saved. Now what's interesting is in an environment in which feminism as an individual sport, buy the book, ask for the raise, take the seat at the table, has failed, has failed, okay? Where the percent of, you know, the pay, gender pay gap will close in 100 plus years. The gender board gap in decades, we've stalled out. Diversity on Wall Street, gender diversity has gone backwards over the past 10 years. Same thing in venture capital. It's gone backwards. It used to be 10% of all venture right? capital partners in 1999. They went down to 6% when I started the fund. And here's the tragedy, yeah. right? These are money industries that give out money. Yeah. And so, you know, women have been left on the outside. But the number one, number two, and number three things that actually gain importance with age is an action I can take myself. Right? I don't have to wait for my boss to decide to give me the raise after I ask. I can make the choice to invest and save. So that was the first thing that was most interesting, thing, interesting to me. The second thing, um, just to be a broken record, is we asked about the, how big you think your pay gap is, how big you think your investing gap is. 51% of women had never thought of the concept of an invest, gender investing gap. And when we asked them how much they cost, it, we thought it cost them, they guessed something that was a tenth of the size. A tenth of the size. So oh, it's probably 100,000 bucks as opposed to a million bucks. And so we vastly underestimate what this cost us. So investing myths. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of investing myths you know out there. It. What's one or two that is worth the group knowing? Well, again, um, boys are better at math than girls. Actually, not true. We women, we females make better grades than the boys do in everything, and as good a grades in math. Um, the perception that men are better investors than women. Women actually study after study after study outperform men by, in some cases, a percentage point a year, which really adds up. That's mostly because we do not trade as much as the guys do. Therefore, we don't pay the fees the guys do. And here's the other thing. We don't panic as much in downturns. You know, the guys will tend to, the market goes down, they begin to trade. You know, we're busy with the two kids, we're driving the carpool, we're at the job. And in fact, when we saw the recent market volatility, our volume didn't go up at all. It didn't go up at all. Um, we tend to say women are risk averse. Yep, there's something about having a uterus that obviously drives risk aversion. That's not true. Um, we are not risk averse, we're risk aware. <laughs> what that means is that we need to under, we demand to understand risk before we take it in plain English. As soon as we understand it, we take as much as the guys do. But if you say, what's my downside? And they say, well, the standard deviation, we're like, I'm out. If we say, look, in a reasonable worst case, it could be down by X amount. We built this into the LFS platform. And the final one that just feels so right is women just need more financial education to invest. That just feels so right. I mean, after all, we love to get A's, so definitely we need more. Well, the guys need more too, but they invest anyway. And so, you know, a lot of the um, plat investing platforms for women have been built around women saying, I want more financial education. That's great. And uh, what we found at Elevest is nobody, nobody reads it. You know, for y'all, it's interesting. You're probably like, oh man, I love a Saturday night with some financial education. I'm telling you what, <laughs> good times, good times. But for the average person, doing the laundry is more interesting than financial education. And so, so many of the offerings have given them have given women financial education that they then ignore. 
And so we built one where instead of you have to have a degree in investing in order to invest, that you can invest by understanding a you know, few simple, straightforward concepts. That's great. So let me shift for a second. We'll go back to LFS. But we've got a lot of people in this room, incredibly high overachievers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, who want to change the world, right. and they want to, in many cases, want to change the world for women. How, how should they think about, is it better to go to a startup to do that, or is it better to go into traditional, if they want to do finance, into a big financial services company? How do you think about the sort of fastest, most significant way to make an impact? Well, look, the one thing I would say about a startup is you'd better be passionate about whatever the underlying concept is, whether it's your own idea or whether you're buying into somebody else's dream. And if you are not, do not do it. You know, all this gauzy startup, you know, we're gonna be in a cool office and there's gonna be a foosball machine and we're gonna have homebrewed coffee on tap and kombucha on the other tap and <laughs> we're gonna have brick walls and then it's gonna be hard for like six minutes and then we're gonna be billionaires, that's gonna be amazing. It just isn't true. In fact, I have a, a member of my family who quit a friggin' great job at Goldman because she's just dying to be an entrepreneur and she gets there. And look, guys, okay, so, you know, I sort of was in some senior positions. Our first office at Elevest had mice. And I would get in early in the mornings to wipe the mouse poop off of everybody else's desk because I was scared they were gonna quit if they saw it. <laughs> Okay, so if I had not, you know, like, I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. You need to be so passionate about it that you're ready to come in and wipe the mouse poop off. You can quote me on that, <laughs> okay? So until you do, I would, I, would get, I would work to get as much education as you can. I think really what you wanna do, whatever job you go into after this, you're likely to be out of it after a year anyway. You're likely to have three or four jobs before you really find it. So I would urge you to focus on finding the jobs in which you can learn the most and grow the most. And you know, a, a, um, to, you know, an associate training program at a consulting firm or a bank, those are fantastic, fantastic to con continue growing and learning. And you can find your place later, whether it's a startup or whether it's an established company. Um, I think the real key as an individual is learning how to take risk and learning how to take smart risk. Because the way you're gonna have an amazing career is not by standing in the middle of the pack with everybody else and getting through the meeting and pushing the piece of paper, right? The way, the way I had an amazing career is I made a few important calculated bets, like when I was director of research at Sanford Bernstein, I got us out of investment banking, most companies Research firms were in research and investment banking. This group will understand, you have the same person doing it, that's a fundamental conflict, right? Your research client, you wanna buy the stock low, sell high, your investment banking client, you wanna sell high into the IPO market. Who are you working for? I got us out of the investment banking business, gave up millions of dollars, we were the biggest research only firm. The research scandal, the NASDAQ crash happens, all the other firms are added as having these conflicts, saying, you know, we um, recommend this stock, and then emailing this stock's a POS, literally. Well, not literally POS, but literally they were emailing that. And all those emails came out, all those companies, a bunch of people got fired, huge fines were paid, hundreds of millions of dollars. Bernstein's business did this. They made me CEO, and I was on the cover of friggin' Fortune magazine. Right? That's the kind of risk you take. Huh, this is the right thing to do. Feels like everybody else is doing the wrong thing. I'm willing to give up money to not be in the pack to make the bet. And that made my career. It's awesome. Speaking of being on the cover yeah. of magazines, you and a number of kick ass women at your current company were yeah. on the cover of Money Magazine yes. just recently. Um, and one of the things that struck me looking at it was just the diversity. Um, of skin color and otherwise, there was a pregnant woman there. I mean, it was just beautiful. Um, I'm curious, how do you sort of ensure that the work environment at LFS, especially a startup with limited resources, is inclusive? And beyond being a female CEO, how do you think about sort of 
best practices that these people can <clears throat> all take into companies everywhere as they move up to sort of make yeah. the company really inclusive? And what are the best practices? So first of all, I would say I believe deeply, deeply, deeply in the business power of diversity. And you can all read the research, right? The diverse leadership teams have higher returns on equity, not by a little, but by a lot. Lower risk, greater innovation, greater client engagement, greater employee engagement, go on and on. Diverse teams are so powerful that they outperform smarter and more capable teams. And we all know why. If you stop and think about it, if, you know, one Sally Krawcheck is here and then I hire another Sally Krawcheck, I've hired nobody and then I hire a third and a fourth and a fifth, it's just a bunch of me's. Or, in the case of certain industries I've worked in, a bunch of white, male, Ivy League educated, you know, trained on the same trading desk, families vacation together, same experiences, same background. Different golf scores. D really close golf scores because they golf together all the time. And what I saw, going into the financial crisis, because I was, at those, I was at those meetings, is that these individuals who had the same experiences, as things got worse and worse, they would say to each other, well, you know, gosh, this is bad, but it, you know, it's not nearly as bad as that time. Oh, I remember that time, I know. Well, wh I'm like, what, what time, what happened? And because they all had the same experiences, they came to the same conclusions, and Citigroup essentially went bankrupt. Right? The economy essentially crashed. And so we all know, every one of us knows, let's you know, just admit it, that as we envision the trading floors on Wall Street, which are 90% male and overwhelmingly Caucasian, everyone here in their gut knows that if it had been half women and 40% people of color, that the crash wouldn't have been nearly as bad as it was. We know that, and the research backs it up. In fact, there's research that is widely ignored on Wall Street that shows the risk levels on Wall Street go up and down with the testosterone of the men in the room. There have been like literal blood tests that have been done. Oh, the, the, there's actual data that on boards, corporate boards, if yeah. you have at least three women on your board, often yeah. a very large boards, their odds of making a bad purchase of another yeah. company go way down, yeah. right? Because there's something about the testosterone and this the data. risk awareness, the difference of perspective. So you start off with, I believe in this deeply. And then when you start a company, you say, we're gonna start with diversity. And this is gonna be a diverse team. And I have stopped our team from hiring when we have gotten two, you know, two in one direction. And in our case, it tends to be, all of a sudden we got too many bottle blonde Caucasian females. Like, stop, we're skewing. Well, but Sally, we've got really somebody great for client service, and she's this, and she's got this great, this, you know, she looks like, you're like, no, I, I'm sure she's great. I'm sure she's amazing. But because she's so much like us, we're gonna default to that, right? And so we're not gonna hire for this role, even if it takes us weeks or months, which in a startup is a long time, until we can find someone who's different from us so that we can get the benefit of that. And the company learns. And it was really interesting because my co-founder and I had some heated arguments at the beginning when somebody who reported into us a couple levels down would want to hire somebody just like them and I would say no and he would say we have to let our managers manage. Otherwise they're not going to feel like we're behind them and they're going to feel like we're second guessing them and I said I totally understand that. But I worked on Wall Street for 25 years, it was a meritocracy. Damn, those white men are good, <laughs> right? Damn, you have a meritocracy and you end up with 90% white men. Those guys are good, <laughs> except financial crisis, right? <laughs> so I call it a mantocracy. My husband who works on Wall Street is like, would you stop? I'm like, no, I can't. Um, but we, so first I believe deeply in diversity and from then, that's not enough. You need to focus on inclusivity. And what that really is, is finding a way to manage each person to bring out their best. And the, the easiest example I can tell you is, it's easy to manage an extrovert. You just sit back and let them go, right? They come at you. It's managing the introverts. And how do you bring out the best in a shy person? 
particularly when you've got a company like ours that are full of big personalities, but you want to be pulling the best out of everybody and make them feel like they walk into work every day and say, I'm good. I mean, we, um, we have a woman uh, within our organization who was a summer intern for us, and she said for the first two weeks, she's like, can, can I let them know I'm a lesbian? I couldn't in my other firm. I don't know, just after two weeks, she's like, all right, I'm out. And so the, it was really gratifying that people feel like they can be their full selves. That's great. One of the things I noticed getting to sit on your board, which mm -hmm. is you know such a terrific board, how you run it, um, is that you manage to run the business. I mean, my favorite Sally story is that when she demanded that we have a budget meeting this on January 3rd, I think we were having a board meeting January 30th, so she could give everyone their KPIs and all the things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the level of rigor and sort of sort of um, focus on management in the nuts and bolts. And at the same time, what's striking to me is how creative you are and your ability to stay creative. And I'm not the only one that thinks this because apparently Fast Company named you as one of the most creative people in the world. So how do you manage when you're in a job and you're trying to perform like so many of us do day in and day out mm -hmm. to keep that creativity? And what are sort of the things that people in this room can sort of well, that's do? Well, that's the fun part. And what, what I love about being a CEO and what I loved about being a research analyst, if any of you are going in that direction, is that it's back and forth between the two. And so you can give one part of the brain a rest while you're working on the other part. So, you know, the creativity I hold, I've, I've gotten to know myself. And it's really only recently that I've really gotten to know myself. But what I know is that I'm at my most creative in the morning and late at night. And again, if there's... Research Sally behind doesn't it. sleep, by the way. I don't sleep. <laughs> um, but I, I go to, you know, it's, it's, I wake up and I pull out the computer and I start to write or, or you know, our lead designers, like, just ne please just not anymore. Like, in the morning, I'm like, I woke up with this idea and we should do this. She's like, hashtag no new ideas, Sally. <laughs> um, but, you know, you let yourself go, but I find it exhausting. And then the, the model building and the analytics, I actually find very relaxing. I mean, I'll build an earnings model, and my husband will be like, you know you've been at work for six hours, and I'm like, and I just got the balance sheet to balance. I mean, it's amazing. And so I love the going back and forth of the two, and I, I, I use it in a different rhythm. So I keep my mornings as open as I can, early creativity, analytics, and then I, I use the afternoon for meetings because I tend to run down a little bit in the afternoon, and so the energy that I can get from other people sort of gives me a second wind. Um, I go home, I sort of collapse early. I try to drink every night by myself. Um, I just think that's really that's important. That's what all our companies yeah, do. Yeah, just really important. You know, often the cat will be with me. Um, but you know, the weird thing I find, I have another burst of creativity literally when I turn out the light. I mean, if I, it's the weirdest thing. If I try to sort of sit there and, and come on, Sally, be creative, it doesn't work. But the minute I begin to relax and to sleep, the ideas start to pop. And so I get them all written down. Do you have and a pen and paper next to your bed? I, the iPad or the iPhone Excellent. next to Got it. Got it. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, but I think it's about getting to know yourself. The other place I have great ideas is on walks, which I can't do a lot during the week. Um, and there's, again, research behind that, the blood flow to the hmm. brain, you know, taking your attention off. Um, Einstein used to take a lot of walks, so that's right. Great. So some people would say just putting our money in Elevest mm -hmm. is having an impact. You seem to have made a pretty big announcement recently yeah. that is sort of impact on steroids. Yeah. Right? And so talk to this group about what was that announcement as it yeah. relates to impact and impact investing, something that many people in this room have reached out to me to ask about and, and yeah. what's happening in LVS. Well, first of all, I'm on a journey because when I was running Merrill, I had plenty of people come to my office and say, we have a new impact investing product and we want to talk to you about it. And I said, get out of my office, you friggin' tree hugger. Like, no, this is the impact investing. It, it doesn't, you know, you've got to give up return. And what you really need to do is invest professionally, get the highest risk adjusted return, and then give your money away. <clears throat> and happily, I continue to learn. And anybody who tells you that is four or five years out of date because impact investing has developed in a way so there's no longer you're just pulling things out, but you're really investing in things. Um, and there's no reason in the world that investing in improving the environment or invest, investing in a better society, there's not a reason in the world that should get lower returns. 
Um, where, we, where we have gone, and I did this with the Pax Elevate Fund and we're doing with Elevest, is sort of a twist on it, which is that the impact investment products that we brought out about two or three weeks ago, Elevest Impact Portfolios, um, on our digital side are ETFs, some mutual funds, that look to, that look to give a competitive return and look to drive positive social and economic change by advancing women. Hmm. And so it goes to what most of the gender lens investing is right now, companies that have more women on their boards or in their management roles. And we've just talked about how those can have better ROEs, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe, and the research I believe shows, that can translate into better stock price performance. But we're also, we've also got investments in there that get money to women who are starting businesses, particularly uh, oftentimes women of color in urban settings looking to start florists and beauty salons and small businesses, um, looking to get money to real estate developments that put aside portions of it for women who've been victims of domestic abuse. The great thing about this is that when you invest in women, they are more likely to pay you back. They take the wealth that they build and put it into their communities, into their families, into society. They give away more of their money to nonprofits, right? And so you, you know, you're doing good for everybody. Now, we did get a little bit of the, I don't know, this investing in woman thing, that, that's a little weird. I'm like, all right, well, if you're not investing in women, what are you investing in? Men. And they're awesome. I've been married to a couple of them. I think they're amazing. <laughs> really, I think they're fantastic, fantastic creatures. And you have a son. Right? And I've got a son, and I've got a brother, and I've got a father. I'm just crazy, crazy about men, crazy about men. However, why wouldn't we take 50% of our portfolio or 20% of our portfolio or five and invest in women? and get the returns that are available to us. So what's really exciting about Elevest right now is Jenny knows this. We were so excited when Rethink Impact raised their money, and what a badass, right? I mean, a lot of, the, a lot of these funds, I, I said, I want to have impact funds invest in us. I'd like to have ones that look for women CEOs. I'd like to have women. Most of them, as, I, as we started to do our last raise, and I would Google, it would be we've raised half a million dollars, we've raised a million dollars. You raised how much, 120? 112, I think we, we cut it oh. off, actually. My we God, were... right? Like, wow. And so we've got Rethink, we have Salesforce, which has their impact fund. We have some truly badass women. You know, Melody Hobson in the asset management space, Venus Williams, et cetera. So what we have is we have impact in women, Investing in Elevest, which is run by women for women, that helps women invest to get more money, so those good things happen when they get more money. And they're investing in Elevest Impact Portfolios, which gets to more women, so those good things are happening. So it's a cascading effect, and what I hope to do is as we become a very successful and profitable company, we give great returns to these impact investors so they can recycle that money and do it all over again. And so we're not just mission driven on one level, we're mission driven throughout. And I think the ripple effect can be tremendous. Oh, it's amazing. We were today with a number, Rethink Impact is unusual, not just because we have thankfully a lot of money, but half of our investor base are women. Um, and they're from 32 different states. And so we brought a number of these female investors together and do quite often. And so for them to see that their money is coming into female fund managers and then going into this ripple that Sally described is an incredibly powerful thing. And you've got people who are ready to just recycle it. Um, it's pretty amazing. Because here's the truth, guys, as we just mentioned. Venture capital, 95% of the partners are men, right? Um, the percent of venture capital money that goes today to women-only teams is 2.5% which is down from 20 years ago when my mom actually ran a VC. Despite the fact that First Round Capital has research that says company startups run by women have 63% better returns than men. So I don't think that's a coincidence, right? Men, you know, few women in VCs, few women getting VC dollars. You know, in my old world on Wall Street, remember, same thing, right? It's a money industry and women aren't investing as much. So what we can do, guys, is we can wait 
for the gentleman to change that. That's what we've, I don't want to say that's exactly what we've been doing for a while, but we've sort of, you know, let things move on and we sort of felt like things were moving forward. And so maybe that, those numbers will double, right? And we'll get to 10% women VCs and 4% of money will go to women, you know, startups, right? That's a big deal. We can wait for that or we can do what we're doing, which is that women need to have more money and take their money and make some bets and really start sort of our own financial infrastructure by betting on each other in a way that we just haven't done historically. I mean, we last summer, um, you may recall <coughs> some of the news on sexual harassment stuff in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. Um, so we decided to write an open letter. We put it on our website and said, hey, all you women out there, you're running a company. You don't have a ping pong table in your office. That's fine. We're not going to hit on you. We're taken. Come on down. <laughs> we're happy to do office hours. My compliance officer loved that. Um, we're happy to do office hours in San Francisco, New York, and DC, our three offices. We had every slot filled through the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, like that, right? We opened on our website. So we then opened up, and thankfully, people are now doing this around the country. We offered men to come too, as long as they were doing something good for the world and had a gender diverse team. But, you know, this just shows that this moment in time is ripe and there. Let me shift gears, Sally. Hold on, before yeah. you do, before you do, um, look. You know, I would say when I was on Wall Street, we women did not support each other as we should have, and we separated from each other. And the truth is, if I looked deep into the recesses of my soul, um, and you said, if you're, you know, why aren't you, you know, you're at an event, and of course there are 90% guys and 10% women, and I'm standing over with the guys, why? Right? Because if you wanted to be successful, you had to be in with the guys. There was one seat at the table for a woman, for a person of color, and if you wanted that seat, you know, you might not help the person come up behind you because you weren't ready to leave. And so they set, you know, I, I'm not sure the patriarchy set out to let's separate them, but effectively we got separated. And when we're separated, we're weak. It's really only by coming together that we're strong. So one woman going to the CEO of their company and saying, hey, you know, how about we have a parental leave policy that's, you know, more than two weeks um, isn't going to make any difference. But women coming together and as a group, maybe, the, you know, I, I use the term weaponizing the women's diversity group and everybody coming together as they did at the New York Times and saying, what if we have a 12-week parental leave for women and men, that can make a difference. And I think what we've learned through Me Too and Time's Up is that, again, feminism as an individual sport only got us so far. But it's by coming together and amplifying each other and the voices that we make a difference. And this is new and it's changing and social media is driving it and millennials are driving it in a way our generation wasn't able to and just didn't. Yeah, it's really powerful. Powerful. And women sporting women mm -hmm. and at every shot. I mean, and I would encourage everyone here when you are working, at every place you can get, I mean, at least my experience has been, where you can help another woman, it will come back and it will work in your favor in the end. I call mm -hmm. it karma, call it what you want. I want to shift back to LFS for a yeah. minute. Talk really tactically, how does LFS work? So if anyone here was going to yeah. say, okay, I have a ton of student loans. One, yeah. should I be investing? Right. Should I be paying yep. off my loans? Two, sort of, do I have minimums to get started? Yeah. How do I really do it? If I believe in what you're saying and I'm throwing $100 out yeah. every time I don't, every day that I don't invest, how do I do it? Let's say I've got a job next year for $85,000 or whatever it is. So look, what, the first thing I would say is a dollar invested in your 20s is so much more valuable than a dollar invested in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s and your 60s. The power of compounding, all of you know this from here. The worst advice I've ever heard, my ex-husband told my brother, don't worry about investing in your 20s because you're going to make so much money later. You want to start as soon as you can, and you want to make it a habit. If you have credit card debt, you got to get that paid off first. If you have student loan debt, you want to pay that on time. But generally, the rates are low enough on student loan debt. Pay it off on time, but begin to invest. You need to build an emergency fund. You want to have three to six months of take-home pay in there, liquid, ready for you because boyfriends and girlfriends leave, you get kicked out of apartments, you get pregnant, 
you lose your job. I promise you, all this stuff you don't think can happen to you, it has all happened to me, all right? Every bit of it. Like, when I was pregnant with my son, I was practically in the delivery room before I figured it out. I mean, it was just like, what is going on? Right there with you. Like, I'm like, I'm gaining weight. I just don't get it. And then, like, oh, my God. Don't tell him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we tell him he's very planned for all that good yeah, stuff. <laughs> but, like, every, all this stuff is going to happen to you. You're going to be like, I can't even believe it. Um, from then, if your job has a 401k, of course you want to be investing that, particularly if there's a match, because you get the benefit of the tax deferral, and then the match is just free money. And it's astonishing to me how many people with even your, the backgrounds you have do not access free money. That's just crazy, okay? So you want to do that. Can and I take my 401k and move it to Elevest, or I just yeah. put it wherever they put it? Well, or if you, no, 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 no. If, you, if it's at a job, you've got to keep it with the company. As soon yeah. as you go leave, then you roll it over to Elevest into an IRA and try to get it consolidated in one place so you get one holistic view of it. And from then, you want to start investing with Elevest or which, with whatever other firm makes sense to you, though I can't imagine who else that would be. Um, <laughs> Elevest has no minimum. This was super important to me because we want women and men to begin investing from the first dollar they can afford. Your target is going to be that you should, you should um, of your take-home pay, 50% should go to needs. So your rent, the clothes you got to have for work, gas, all that stuff. you got to have fun, so that's 30%. 30% is going out with your friends, buying the cocktail dress you really don't need, the vacation, et cetera, you got to have fun. And 20%, if you can, sometimes it's hard in the early years, goes to future you, badass grandma you, okay? <laughs> some part of that's going into your 401k, and some part of that is every paycheck going into investing. And if you can only start with 1%, start with 1%, work it up to 2%, work it up to 4%, but... Start with that in mind because the mistake you see a lot of folks make is they spend everything, right? You get as big an apartment as you can and you're not investing in future you. The great thing about making investing a habit is that it even, you know, is we all fear the downturn. And we all know that in 1929, if you'd put money in the day before the market crashed, you wouldn't have gotten back to normal till the 1950s, like 1957 or something. On the other hand, if you had invested just once a year, not even every two weeks, but just once a year, through that down dip, you would have been in the black seven years later. The crash of 20, uh, 2007, 2008, that was really bad. If you had invested that way, I think the recovery was two years. And so it evens out the ups and downs. And if anybody here, I hear so often from people still, you know, well, I don't know about investing. What if the president tweets something? I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm going to wait. You know, maybe the market feels a little frothy or feels high to me. Not even Warren Buffett market times. It is impossible to do. So you have to make it a habit. What I love about Elevest, as you know, is, is something like two-thirds of our clients, you know, have the recurring deposit. So it just smooths the whole thing out for you. So women and men can invest in through Elevest? Yes. Yeah, so the great, th one of the things about Elevest. I see some awesome men who are here. So Yeah. So we, them. so here's what Elevest, here's what make the things that make Elevest for women. Um, Maybe we can put up the slide. Just put so up the slide. Can these. Do I have, uh, hit it here? Okay. Because we got a special gift. All right. This is, by the way, there's a special gift for all of you. It's a present <laughs> from me for all of you when you go and type this in later this evening, a, a gift that involves money as a hint. Free money, free money for you. Um, so one of, one of the things that we discovered when we were building Elevest is that as a fintech company, um, we have an investing algorithm. Um, others do as well. The others' investing algorithms are built for men. Ours is gender aware. What does that mean? It means that when we forecast out your retirement, if you're a woman and you tell us, we take that into account by forecasting that you live six to eight years longer than men. We also forecast out 
based on your level of education, based on your industry, based on your area of the country, how much you're projected to earn over the course of your life. If you're a woman, unfortunately, we have you earn less and we have your salary peak sooner. That is a total bummer. But it's important for us to do because obviously that changes the profile of how much you'll have in retirement. If you're a man and you identify as such, we kill you sooner <laughs> and we have you earn more. Bummer because you reach your goals faster, but this is the only, it's the only gender aware one. And much like in, in medicine, all the tests have been done on Caucasian men. You know, so in financial services, it's all for men. So we're gender aware. And then we have a number of other, you know, gender aware features that you probably wouldn't notice. For example, if you ask a man, what's your investment risk tolerance? Our research shows he will answer you. He does not know and he will answer you. And he only finds out when the market goes down. For women, we will not answer. We will say, I don't know. We will say, I'm going to find out, and then we never come back. Like, you know, everybody would leave when we did the test. And so we said, well, wait a second, we're a fiduciary, which means we're obligated to act in your best interest. We know you won't tell us or you don't know. So instead of building a portfolio off of useless information, we'll give you a risk budget instead. What does that mean? It means if you tell us your goal is to have an emergency fund, we give you no risk, no risk. If on the other hand, you tell me you're 25 years old and your sole goal is retirement at the age of 65, you're getting like 95% equities, more risk. If you want if it's something in between, a 10 year goal, we'll give you a moderate amount of risk. And then we'll tell you if you're tracking to your goal. So the other thing that sends women batty is when the market's down and then you're like, am I gonna be able to retire on time? Nobody else gives you that answer. But we will tell you if you're off track, and if you're off track, what you need to do to get back on. So the market's down 1,000 points. You check in, oh my gosh, I'm off track. And we'll say, put in 500 more bucks, or retire two months later, or you're fine. And so we have sort of these subtle things that you wouldn't know are gender aware, but our research tells us it's gender aware. And am I right that women who make the same as men are three times as likely to be in poverty by the time they're age 75 because of this one difference of whether they invest or not? Is well, that it's, it's um, yes, and also because we tend to have um, higher health care costs during it. retirement as well. So, it's another, so another thing we do is we get you to 90% of your pre-retirement income. That's our goal in retirement. Other people are like 70 because women tend to, because we live longer, we tend to need more health care. And we keep 71% of our money in cash as yes, women? Yes, we do, 71% in cash. And it was just a Glamour magazine study that came out a few days ago that said 85% of women do not own stocks. I don't quite believe it, but it gives you the, the order of magnitude. Well, I would just encourage all of you that are clearly awesome here, whether it's you or a friend or someone else you know, encourage them to invest something in their future because we don't want to keep the statistics going. Um, with that, if you have questions, if you can come down, um, I'm going to, I can keep going because I have a lot more questions people send in advance, but is there a mic somewhere in the thing? Okay. Does, um, does anyone have questions? It's a little hard to see. Yeah. Do any of you come down and ask? And then is there someone else who wants to queue up? One more? Yeah. So we'll get you two up first and then We'll see where we are on time. We only have a few minutes, but I want to make sure to get a few questions. I'll Go talk ahead. fast. I'm Marley Major. Thank you for your talk. Your advice has been amazing. And you talked about somebody coming out at your work before, and I've never considered being a lesbian, but I would switch teams for you because I, I have. <laughs> <laughs> this is like better than porn for me right now. Um, I never got that one before. <laughs> it's a first. It's a first. I, I mean, I'm just trying to be honest. And um, I work with. Can I tweet uh, that? No. I'm just <laughs> I work with women entrepreneurs, a lot of them who are in creative fields, and I, I think my biggest challenge, or one of the challenges I see, is certainly not with this audience, but is getting women excited and, and feeling like they can be excited about investing in money and reading about it. Because so much oh. of it is, you, you've got to show up to the yes. game. So how do we, yes. from a grassroots level, like somehow get them to, oh, it's 
it's the Have word fun. because think about it. Think about what society does to us. We're little girls. Daddy, how much money do you make? We don't talk about that, honey. Mommy, how much did the car cost? Sweetheart, that is not appropriate conversation. How much did our house cost? Shh. You know, this is not something we discuss. We never see our mothers invest. We might see them pay bills, but we do not see them invest. We don't see our mothers come in and high five over the raise. And nobody ever takes us aside and teaches us about money, either at home or at school, the father sometimes will take the sons aside. And so all of society tells us this is not a conversation we should have. But how should parents have it, right? Because there are a lot of times that you should as a talk, parent, you should, at should the you share what your salary sure, is with your family? Sure, absolutely. The Thanksgiving table, sure. You know, we need to start to break through this thing. But think about where we are right now, right? I haven't dated in a long time. <laughs> On what date do you have sex? <laughs> three. Anyone? Apparently anyone, hasn't changed. So. Anyone? I'm going to say it's three because that's what it was when I was dating. And there were some you, threes in the audience. So. Can you imagine if you asked a potentially significant other how much money they made on the third date? Like, <laughs> wouldn't happen. <laughs> right? We, and all of you after you go out after this are so much more likely to talk to each other about sex than talk to each other about money. There's so much shame. I'm shamed because I don't make enough. I'm shamed because I make too much. I'm shamed because I make more than my spouse. I'm shamed because I'm not investing. I'm shamed because I am investing. You know, I, I was on um, death, taxes, and money, some podcast, and the woman started saying to me something about my being a millionaire. And I am. I'm a friggin' multimillionaire, Jenny. <laughs> awesome. I, like, I have never said that before. <laughs> I've never said that before. And they started to ask me about it on the pot, and I'm pitting out. <laughs> like, I'm seriously, it starts to dribble down my side. And I should feel proud of that. And so okay. society puts this on us. And so one of the things we're playing with at Elevest is, you know, sort of how do we disrupt money, right? because we don't know how much of a raise to ask for if we don't know how much of a raise to ask for. If I didn't know better, I think the patriarchy told us this stuff, don't talk about money, to keep us down. What's the number one thing? What's the first thing they did on The Handmaid's Tale? They took away the women's money. So they took away their power, right? And so it's so societal. It's so in, ingrained and embedded. So keep your eye out, because we're going to start to work on this at Elevest, and we're going to give a lot of resources and sources for how can we get this information so that we can know enough to make more money. So how do we get them excited? <laughs> I'm still like I'm still at that point of, like, do we just send them to your website yes. and say you're going to do it? Like, yeah, they will be massively excited when they get there. Well, I was excited when I got there, but yeah. I'm a little bit, no, okay. I mean, I will say as someone, I would do three things, okay. um, not to it. One is send them to the website. Two, tell them that every day they're not investing. Let's say they make, what, $85,000 a it's year for whatever. That's it's a great hundred dollars. It's $100. Bucks. That's a Literally great Literally dropped point. out of their pocket. Yeah. Um, and three, if they care at all about gender equity, at all about society and all the implications for society of having right, yeah. women, just investing not only is it in their self-interest, but it also has as good a social impact as many things they can do. For sure. And so hopefully one of those three, you're appealing to their, their um, ego, you're appealing to their you know, greed, or you're appealing to uh, their altruism. The and I don't that, think it doesn't matter. The thing that often works is to say, look, if you had a hole in your purse and $100 fell out today, right. when would you fix it? Would you let another 100 fall out tomorrow? Yeah, good. Or Saturday or Sunday? I mean, you would p fix the friggin' purse, right? And obviously... You know, it's that that's compounding over time, but that's what, you know, that's what can make a difference. But um, you know, I think encouraging everyone to do it and beginning to see it build can be sort of fun and exciting. I mean, Great you answers, thank you. Every Georgetown MBA to do this. Think about the power. I mean, frankly, men should do it too. It's it's really smart thing to do. Yeah. yeah.
Hi, Sally. I'm Humana, a uh, first year student here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I actually recently opened my first LLS account, so my first <laughs> real investment. Uh, I, don't, I didn't come from a family that really, my mo I've never seen my mother invest. Yeah. Uh, but from what the last question, I brought it up at Y Night with my girlfriends, and it's the most user friendly website. And it helps you invest by your goals, whether you're single or have a spouse, whether you think of having children in short term or long term, when you want to buy a house, if you want to take a really big vacation, and it splits up your investment, which is kind of amazing. Uh, but I also, my question is, I recently listened to one of your podcasts uh, from the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the challenges you faced when you first started in the finance world and how you really face a lot of resistance and a lot of real um, borderline harassment. Yeah. Oh, no, one borderline. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, harassment. And you, the way you fought back was through your quant skills mm -hmm. and bringing up the really thorough multiple regressions. And so for a lot of us that I've never worked in finance before, this summer will be my first time. This has been my first exposure to finance. Yeah. And for a lot of us, I know we're on the same boat. What do you, how did you sharpen up those skills to yeah. be not just as good as all of your male colleagues, but better? Yeah. So first of all, I really hope it's better. Um, and by the way, I thought it was better for a lot of years and I feel terrible that I was in senior positions and didn't realize how much was still going on. Um, I do believe it's better now. I mean, I've, I, um, you know, you now have all these men who are saying, has Me Too gone too far? Has this gone too far? Absolutely not. You know, this is so healthy, what's coming out right now. Um, and this awareness of the behavior that's occurred can enable us all to sort of face the facts and, and move forward. So I'm hopeful that because of this awareness, you won't suffer some of that. That being said, you know, these are tough environments, whether it's men or women, these are high performing cultures. And they value, you know, what I did was I skated to where the puck was and was going, which is if you're in finance, you got to be great at finance. And so, you know, take whatever courses are available here. Um, I found that when people were willing to dismiss me because I was younger, because I was a woman, if I had the numbers, they had to listen. When I was a research analyst, if I had the deepest, best research, they had to listen to me. You know, that their bosses would say, you better not make that investment until you talk to Sally Krawcheck, because I had the 100-page black books. And this is a place where actually being a woman in a man's world as a research analyst really helped me, because it was me and 19 guys were my competitors. And so if one of the guys' research was good, it's like, hey, you should really talk to, I can't remember his name. It was like Tom or John or Joe. Pretty sure he's wearing a tie. I think he had brown hair. Yeah, that. Right? As opposed to, you know, the girl. And everybody's like, oh, the girl with the funny name, Krawcheck. Sure, I got her. Um, so I think that helped. And the other thing that I brought to bear was a sense of humor. She doesn't have one. You haven't noticed that. <laughs> I've got to still work on it. But, but guys, the truth is I've seen too many women in a male environment that let it grind them down. And so did you, Jenny, did you see what just happened? And did you? And... You know, you just said that to me, and, and I, it's getting to me. If we're laughing together, we're not upset with each other. And so I found when you get sort of the can you get coffee comment, if you could make a little joke and just lighten it up, you know, if you could just ease the tension, that people, that people were actually grateful for it. And so I would urge, great at what you do, take all the, the if you're going into finance, get as quantity as you can, and then sort of roll with it a little bit. Obviously not the bad stuff, but some of the other thing, make a joke and move on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. We have time for two more. Go ahead, yeah. We'll, oh, we go oh, there. Yeah. We'll try to do, yeah, let's go. Hi, Sally. Thank you so much for your talk this evening. I've really enjoyed watching your career over the years. I wanted to ask you about trust mm -hmm. and how, how you go about building trust back in financial institutions, especially given everything that's happened with the financial crisis, even a lack of institution, lack of trust in institutions generally. Yeah. How do you build that back up? And how did you actually, even at a micro level, how did you build trust within your team, especially amongst women? Well, look, I can tell you how, 
look, I think it's very difficult if you're at a large, large financial institution um, you know, that has had trust issues, that is, is going through maybe trust issues right now. Those are very difficult reputations to rebuild. And people, and particularly women, are still angry at some of these companies 10 years later. And so you definitely want to work on the reputation and being trustworthy and authentic early because it's hard to get back. I can tell you at Elevest, you know, we try to be authentic and open and honest and transparent. And it really starts with it's something that just didn't matter a handful of years ago. When women come to us, they look to our team page and they're looking to see if they see themselves reflected there. We've got a number of competitors um, in the digital advisor space. And I counted the other week seven of them who are direct competitors to ours. Do you know how many women collectively they have on their boards? Zero, right? And so they're not built, you know, people are looking at them saying, I'm not seeing myself. You know, and so that's a little fray of trust because they'll put out women's initiatives that are all you go girl and let's invest together and then I don't see anyone who looks like me, right? They'll have the teams of women and then you get to the sixth row and there's the one woman who's there and she runs HR, which is amazing, um, but isn't representative of the driver, the P&L drivers of the business. Um, and then, you know, I've got a weekly newsletter and we try to be as transparent as possible. So. You know, we, in the weeks after the recent school shooting, um, got questions from, and even before we got questions, um, knew that our clients were interested in what percent of our portfolios are in guns. And so we went through them and did a lot of work and came out to no more than 0.25% of the portfolio is in guns. And what do you think? And took the feedback from women. It was really interesting because we saw one other digital advisor a couple weeks after us put out something on what theirs was, and frankly, it was misleading. I'll just be honest with you. It talked about, it, it led you to the conclusion that it could be 0%, even though we know their portfolio is well enough to know that they're not 0%, um, and no one else came out with anything. And we got a lot of emails from people, which is, you know, I may not have liked the answer, but I really want to thank you for putting it out there. And so being just a person is really important and being vulnerable is really important. And we've got places at LFS where the product hasn't worked that well. We've been vulnerable about it and we fixed it, right? And when we fix it, we tell them we fix it. Um, but all that can come crashing down, you know, if we do something unethical and it can come, it could stay with us for years. So we are out of time, but oh, one and, more. And let me do, we'll one. do one more. Sally has to catch a flight. We'll do one more, and then I know Jeff has a few uh, couple things to, to share. So let's go ahead, and we'll, we'll do it as quickly as possible. Hi, Sally. I'm Hello. Rachel. Yep. Hi, Rachel. Um, I was wondering, you were saying it's good to have a lot of the data so that people can't ignore you. Um, one of the ways to make sure that your voice gets heard is to have mentors. What do you have uh, in terms of advice for people who are just starting out who would like to reach out? and build those mentorship relationships? Yes, sort of. So ladies, we are over-mentored and under-sponsored. Women have something like five times as many mentors as men do. A mentor is a person who will answer your question. And we have about a tenth or fifth as many sponsors as they do. A sponsor is someone who fights for you. I was let go of Bank of, from Bank of America when I was running Merrill Lynch. The day that I was let go, the business was growing, the only business at Bank of America that was growing, it was gaining share, um, we were beating plan, right? The board knew this. Went to the board, talked to them about it. The day after Labor Day, I was let go. I drank heavily on the first day, obviously. On the second day, I called all the members of the board and said, thank you for the opportunity to run Merrill and what could I have done better? And the answer that came back was that I did not have a sponsor in the room, including my boss, and that nobody fought for me. And so instead of, hey, here's an idea, why don't we let go people who are missing plan and whose businesses are shrinking, just brainstorming, right? <laughs> instead, spitballing a little bit, um, instead what they heard was, if the business is running like this with her, imagine how well it'll do with someone else, okay? 
And so go get those mentors. Go get them, right? Ask people to coffee, talk to people at different companies, ask your boss if it's OK if you go for coffee with his peer and pick their brain and do all of that stuff. You got to you remember the only place it is good enough to keep your head down and get A's and where you'll be successful is school. As soon as you get out of school, getting the A plus is only the beginning. Everybody has, you need to let people know, right? You need to be up and out so that people know you and know of you. And so go do all that stuff, but as you're doing it, at some point try to turn those mentors into sponsors. How do you do that? You're excellent at your job, and then at some point you say, hey, I'm thinking about raising my hand for this promotion, Will, would you support me? And you'll know pretty quickly, right? But you'll want to test and see who are those people who will fight for you. So your job is to be excellent, and your job is to network like crazy, and your job is to turn those mentors into sponsors because they aren't just important. As my career showed, in some instances, they can be absolutely make or break. Awesome. And with that. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Uh, as a business school, we care a lot about making money. Uh, as a business school here at a Jesuit institution with deep values, we care a lot about making an impact. The both of you are great examples. You've shared wonderful lessons about using the power of business and uh, uh, concern for the dignity of all humans and the power of entrepreneurship to make a difference in the world. Um, with that, we thank you very much. I think we have a gift for each of you that Maddie's going to help. Uh, yeah, that's kind of heavy. Sally, we can, we, can, we, can, we can ship it for you if you don't want to take it on the plane. Um, and we'd like to thank all our audience for being here tonight. Uh, thank Paul and uh, Carol Hill for sponsoring this series. We'd like to invite everyone to join us. Just right at the top of the stairs outside, we have a reception. Thank you so much. Thank you.